In this video, we're looking at the turning point in Genesis, Genesis chapter 12 and the call of Abraham. As I was preparing this video, I looked back on last year's video just about the exact same weight. I'm teaching from side. home just as a precaution for all of you. Hopefully we can deliver some high quality material until we can meet once again in person. Today, that was the first week of the COVID shelter at home and social distancing measures. And now we have a vaccine for this virus that has taken over 600,000 lives in the United States alone. Unfortunately, this disease is still raging out of control in many parts of the world. So our struggle is far from over and we really need to express a great deal of concern and action for our brothers and sisters overseas. I had just sold my old camera and microphone system that very week and I wasn't expecting to have to use them right away. So that video was filmed on my iPad with an old lab mic that I still had. Hopefully since then the videos have improved. And finally, the videos on this channel have been watched over 14,000 times for a total of over 1,600 hours of viewing. That humbles me and motivates me at the same time. And the thing to realize is that this is a very, very tiny channel on YouTube. So thanks to everyone who has been part of this journey so far. If you're new to this channel, this is the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I've been teaching seminary in the United States and around the world for over the past 20 years. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching within the seminary classroom and make it available to anyone on YouTube with the goal that you will be encouraged and stimulated in your own personal study of the Bible. Today, we're looking at Genesis chapter 12 and the call of Abraham and how this is the hinge or the turning point chapter in the book of Genesis. Chapter 12 marks a huge turn in the book of Genesis. We shift from global or universal stories to that of a particular family line, from stories like Adam and Eve to Abraham and his family, from stories like the flood or the Tower of Babel to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph's adventures, and from people living hundreds of years to those of normal lifespans. Also notice how the narrative flow slows down at this point. In the first 11 chapters, we've gone from the creation of the world and eternity past all the way up to Abraham's life. Thousands, if not tens of thousands of years within the narrative itself. Now with Abraham, we're going to slow down and it's going to focus on the life of Abraham and then his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. The story starts in Genesis 11:27 with the Todolit, where it says, this is the account of Terah these todoa, these Hebrew expressions, are used to mark the different sort of chapters or episodes within the book of Genesis. They're the breakpoints. And here we have one right here in Genesis 11:27, The account of, or the story of, or the generations of Terah, that's the todoa. Genesis 11:27. This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, and she had no children. Our story actually starts with Abram's father, Terah. The text tells us that he lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. There's two interesting aspects to this statement. The first one is, is that the city Ur was one of the major cities of the ancient kingdom of Sumer. This is where the king Gilgamesh lived and ruled. Yup, the very character that forms the basis of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And most archeologists think that he served as the inspiration were the seed for this epic myth, that there actually was a King Gilgamesh that ruled in that area. But that's beyond the scope of this video. 
But if you're interested in topics like that, I can't highly recommend enough to get a subscription to a service like Biblical Archaeology that really informs you on the wider history and culture around the Bible. Author calls this city Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, if Abram's story takes place around 2000 BC, then this is most likely an editorial change or addition made by a later scribe because the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, really don't appear on the scene until around the 9th century BC. We also need to note that this journey or migration is initiated by Terah, not by Abraham. So what motivated Terah's migration? Was it opportunity or was it the collapse of the Sumerian culture that occurred around 2000 BC? Now notice that Sarah is mentioned three times in this story. She is Abraham's wife in verse 29 and then in verse 30, it says that she was barren. And then in case you missed the point, it says that she has no children. This sets up the central problem or need in the story of Abraham that he is going to be given the promise that his offspring will be as numerous as the stars, but he has no children. Verses 31 and 32. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, and Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Now, if we throw this up on a map, we can see that Ur is at the very base of the Tigris-Euphrates River Valleys here. And they probably followed the river valley up because Haran is in northern Syria, the point of a lot of conflict that we've seen over the last few years in these Middle Eastern wars. And it's in Haran that Terah then settles and dies. So when Abraham is going to be called to go, it's in the middle of this journey. Terah has already led them from Ur up to Haran. Now Abraham is going to lead them from Haran down into the Promised Land. And is given to Abraham in 12.1 to leave the place of his birth, or how the NIV translates it as your country. Only Ur of the Chaldeans can be understood, despite the fact that the narrative of the chapter of 12 makes no mention of that, and the text explicitly tells us that he is in Haran when this occurs. But they want you to see that Abraham's call is part of this larger journey, perhaps something that Terah was called to in the first place. Who is also confirmed by a later reference to Abraham's call in 15.7. There the author looks back on the call of Abraham and he sees it as a call from Ur of the Chaldeans rather than from Haran. This view is also picked up in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 7, and also in the book of Acts, chapter 7. To leave your family and clan at that time would have been a profoundly traumatic event, and in fact, more challenging than it is today. The second thing is, is that Terah and Abraham's ability to go on this migration really points to the fact that Abraham and Terah and his family came from a clan that were shepherds. They shepherded animals across the land. This gave them portable income and the ability to travel, where something like a brick maker or a carpenter just could not have undertaken this type of a journey. The other thing that we need to realize is that by labeling this as Ur of the Chaldeans, it sets up or ties in with later books within the Bible. When the people of God are deported from Jerusalem off into the Babylonian captivity, their journey and return is going to mirror that of Abraham's, just as Abraham traveled from this region to the Promised Land. When the Israelites get their freedom from the Babylonians, they too are going to make a similar journey back to the Promised Land. Chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now when Abraham is told to set out from your country and your kindred, that really gives us a picture that he's being called to set out from Ur, 
not Haran where he currently is. So it's picturing the whole journey, the one that Terah started and that Abraham is in the middle of it. This can be seen how the travel narrative is resumed. In 12.4 it says, so Abraham went. This story is usually entitled the Lech Lecha within the Jewish communities. The verb there, go, is in the imperative form and it's derived from the verb to walk, halak. This sets in motion the grand narrative from this point on until the book of Joshua. The people of Israel are going to be migrants wandering on the face of the earth in search of a homeland that God promises them here. Now in the middle of these promises it says that I will make you a great nation. Now Abraham most likely was the leader of a very large and rich tribe. We can see this when they're in the land of Cana and they actually go to battle against the five kings from sort of northern Syria that have been raiding the land of Cana. Abraham is called a mighty king and warrior by the other Canaanite tribes down there at that time. So it's just not him, his wife, his cousin Lot, but they have a lot of people going with them as well. Five times within this passage, the verb barak or bless in English is used in these three verses. But when you look at Abraham's life, it's not one that you would characterize as being full of blessing. He's constantly in danger, on the move. He has strife within his family. He sends away one of his own children and must sacrifice the other one. So this whole idea that I will bless you really kind of makes you think about what is God doing with Abraham? In 12.3, when it says that all the families of the earth will be blessed through you, this harks back to the Tower of Babel, all the diversity that the story that the Tower of Babel then creates. All these different clans and families and tongues are now going to be blessed through Abraham. By placing the call of Abraham after the dispersion of the nations at the Tower of Babel in chapter 11, Abraham's call is pictured as God's gift of salvation or redemption in the midst of that act of judgment. This blessing also goes back and picks up an idea that originally came in 128, be fruitful and multiply, and then was marked off by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in 217. But then it's demonstrated again in the ark in 723 that saved life now this blessing is located in Abraham and his seed or offspring. This idea of the seed also goes back to the fall. Remember, when God curses them after their disobedience, he turns to Eve and he says, your seed will crush his head, but he will strike his heel. And this idea of who is this promised seed is something that has come along. And now it's being picked up here with Abraham as well. Blessing that God will bless Abraham and then he will be a blessing to all the nations in the world is going to take generations, if not centuries, to realize. Even then, Israel will not exactly be the most blessed of all nations. It will be split by civil war, sent off into slavery, and then finally reconstitute their nation only to have it subjugated by the Romans. So Jesus comes along, Abraham's heir, that this blessing really finally begins to realize for all the nations of the world. And like Abraham, this blessing is for all the nations of the world. God's plan for Israel, just like that of the church, extends beyond and obliterates national and ethnic boundaries. But we erect them faster than it seems God can rip them down. Also notice how this promise to Abraham, how long it will take, even to this day, it is not fully realized yet. We pick up again at 12.4. So Abraham left as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated on all the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. Now remember in the story of Noah, how Noah did all that God commanded him. 
Here in this story, we also see Abram's obedience to God's command to go. In 12.1, it literally, God literally tells him to walk, to go. And the translation here, Abraham left, is, and he walked. The reference here to Abraham going from Ur to Haran down to the promised land is also illustrative of the value of owning a good biblical atlas. By having an atlas, you can actually look up and take a look at the maps and see exactly sort of the route that they think Abraham took at that time. And it really helps inform this story a great deal. It helps you understand exactly how far they walked, where they went, and where these different locations are at. Abraham's entry into the land of Cana is also highly selective. Only three sites are mentioned, Shechem in verse six, and then Bethel and Ai in verse eight, and then the Negev in verse nine. Now, as Kasudo, an Old Testament scholar, has pointed out, it can hardly be accidental that these are the three same locations that are visited by Jacob when he's going to return to Cana from Haran, remember when he has to flee Esau, and then he meets Rachel and Leah, and then he's coming back. These are the three same sites he goes. And also in the conquest of the land under Joshua, these three sites are specifically mentioned as well. And so we see how we have these intertextual references here that link all these stories together. The Old Testament narratives don't simply recount places, times, and events to teach us something about ancient history. By carefully choosing their words, the authors of these ancient texts signal to us, the readers, the key relationships within these ancient stories to show us their meaning and how they're linked together. Now, Abraham's story teaches us a number of key things. First off, let's consider Abraham's narrative trajectory. In Genesis, Abraham is presented as one of the most important forefathers to whom God gives the promises and with whom God makes a covenant. On most occasions, it is linked to a specific element, either the promise of the land, the promise of the seed, or the promise of the covenant in Genesis 17. And Abraham is also promised to be a blessing to all the nations. The second most frequent image for Abraham in the book of Genesis is that of a model of obedience. He is the example of obedience par excellence. Third, the blessing of all nations through Abraham is highlighted not only in general statements in the book of Genesis, but also in his role as an intercessor. You see this when he intercedes for Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah, but then also how he intercedes and goes to battle against the five kings from the north to protect the other people in the land of Cana. And then finally, the divine human encounter is a central motif in this story, and a close scrutiny of these texts show how much of the action is embodied in the conversations between God and Abraham instead of direct narration of events. And remember I said that it's through what a character says that often the most important elements of the story are communicated. And these stories with Abraham, it's these divine human encounters, these dialogues between God and Abraham that are so important. There are also a number of very important themes that are introduced in this story as well. The first one is the threat to God's promise. In nearly every episode that follows, a promise to this seed, the blessing to all peoples on the earth or the gift of the land, is placed in jeopardy by the actions of the characters in the narrative. The promise looks as if it will fail on numerous occasions. In the case of such a threat, however, the narratives show that God always remains faithful to his word and that he himself enters into the arena and safeguards the promise. The purpose of such a recurring narrative theme is to show that only God can bring about his promises. Man's failure cannot stand in the way of God's promises. The theme that's introduced is that God's promises and plans do not come in the manner that we anticipate. This story with Eve who declared that I have produced a man just like God in Genesis 4.1, but it's not Cain or Abel who this promise is going to come through. God doesn't work through them, but through the third son, Seth. 
And now it's going to be seen in this promised seed to Abraham. The story of Ishmael falls dead center in the middle of the Abrahamic narratives. And as such, it raises an interesting question. The attention given to this story points to the fact that Abraham and Sarah are trying to bring about God's promises, but God wants to do things a different way and bring new life to Sarah in her old age. Third, Abraham's journeys prefigure Israel's experiences. We've already looked at this, how he was called from Ur of the Chaldeans, and later in this chapter, he's gonna go down into Egypt due to a severe famine in Israel. This will be echoed by Joseph and the 12 brothers going down to Egypt and then returning from Egypt out of bondage during the Exodus. The authors of the Bible did not just record historical information. Rather, they carefully structured the stories and select the events they want to relate so that we would be able to see the implications of these stories to our lives and to others in the Bible. The past is not allowed to remain in the past. It's lessons that are drawn upon by future generations. And we see patterns of how a faithful and loving God interacts with those in the past, and we can expect such promises to hold true in our lives as well. What he did for Abraham, he's got to do for the people of Israel in the Old Testament, for the people of God in the New Testament, and for us today as well. The fourth theme that's introduced in the life of Abraham is that of the promises. Israel will become a great nation while in Egypt nonetheless, just as God promised. And God also wants to bless all the nations through Abraham. Now this theme is dramatically picked up in the New Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham in a special sense. And this blessing is now shed upon us to bless the nations of the world not just our particular church or our particular country, no matter where you are in the world. And in this regard, the future is calling us forward. As Revelation 4.9 says, they will sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a nation and priests serving our God, and they will reign on the earth. And so if that is the eschatological reality that we're headed towards, then we need to be involved in this blessing to all nations. I don't know a better way to leave you than on that note, and so I will leave you with the word of peace. These little icons up here on the side they're actually live links. You can click on it and it'll take you right to those videos. So go and check out some of the other videos we have on this channel.